Hello and welcome to Calm Versations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's Calm Versant is Jason Littlefield. Jason Littlefield has been a public school teacher. I want to say professional and then professor, but we're going to land on teacher. And then he went away from that because he saw the encroachment of social justice ideology bearing down on the public education sector. And then he did some romping in the world. He came back and got into social emotional learning. And that's a training regimen to um, help teachers and students better understand how learning happens socially and emotionally. I think that's fair enough to say, but we get into the details of this a little bit later on in the interview. He also saw the encroachment of social justice ideology in that realm, in the social and emotional learning realm, and he also witnessed its impact on people's social and emotional health. And then him and Eric Smith and Xander Keg have gotten together and put together a professional development suite titled Empowered Pathways, which is found at empoweredpathways.org. And they provide professional development and consulting and other resources to help people um, kind of backtrack from the activist critical theory lens to a more liberal and humanist lens of individualism and meritocracy and compassion. Powerful stuff. And Jason's a great guy. And so we sit down in this conversation. We talk about all these things. I don't think I will say anything more. Let's dive right in with Jason Littlefield of Empowered Pathways. How's your day going? Hide myself. I'm cranking into gear. Nice. What about you? Oh, not too shabby. Uh, this is a highlight for sure. So thank you uh, for reaching out. Yeah, for sure. I'm uh, so excited to emotionally learn from you and so <laughs> via a social interchange. Man, that term is, uh, whew, I don't even know what to say about it anymore. Well, there's a lot of terms. I was looking through this website. You got successor ideology, which I knew is a Wesley Yang thing, but I still, nobody's ever explained it to me. And then okay, social okay. emotional learning neuroplasticity neuroplasticity is, yeah that's what happens when when the baby falls off the bed and bounces on his head a few times right exactly boing, exactly boing, <laughs> boing. is there is there some uh sort of anecdote how you got into uh this uh the, yeah it's a <clears throat> it's an interesting it's an interesting ride and i think i might uh can make it short, but it goes back to 2012. Okay. That's not yeah. terribly long ago. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first yeah, end it, of the world. There, there's some parallels between your story uh, as well. No, do tell. 2017. Uh, okay. You want me to just kind of jump into it? Yeah, sure. Sweet. Okay. So I've been in public education uh, for 20 years. And around 2011, 2012, I started to understand that the ideas in place were those put forth by the Frankfurt School. Uh, I saw that critical theory was the, not just critical race theory, but critical theory was the tool of problem solving. And I knew, like, basically I figured out the system was not set to uh, benefit the individual, but the system was set up to um, tear down the individual. Oh, and replace and it with a good little citizen <clears throat> or activist or what? Global citizen, activist, uh, you know, those types of things began to pop up. And I saw, you know, I guess what we call now is social justice ideology as this, uh, as a wildfire burning in the distance. It's like, oh, wow, one day, one day this thing is going to be big. And I don't want to be here or be any part of it. So in 2012, I left public education and I left the United States of America with the intention of pursuing my own happiness. Like this thing is, it's destined to destroy. It's already set in a place. It's already kind of inked its way into our institutions. And there we go. Mm -hmm. So 
I thought that was going to be a forever move, but turns out it was only a, a one year move that I got to live in China and I got to live in Benin, Africa during that year. And I learned a lot from living in those lands, the friendships, the relationships, the understanding, the political, the political aspects of living in a uh, communist country and then uh, also in a third world country. So really experiencing that. And then uh, so when I was leaving Africa, I, I said, OK, what do I want to do now? Because I just made the move of walking away from public education uh, entering basically international life uh, and just kind of pers pursuing that. So now I was forced to reckon and do that again. And at this moment, I, I said, you know, I, I really want to help people. Uh, I want to find ways to increase human potential. I want to help students. I want to help educators really make sense of the world uh, and really inque increase cooperation and really okay. kind of address things that that aren't being addressed and <clears throat> when i came back i ended up being a social and emotional learning specialist where i actually started learning you know more about mindfulness more about self-management more about healthy relationships about increasing uh mindsets of inquiry and compassion and how to disrupt patterns, all, all of those things. And then around 2017, uh, actually, let me let me back up to maybe 2016. Okay, when some of my colleagues started going to these trainings, and then I'm told, Hey, Jason, you should go check, check these out. I was like, Okay, so I went to uh, one of the diversity trainings. And I remember in the uh, in the introduction, when they were talking about the company and how they were founded, uh, the main facilitator was like, yeah, the the founder was a direct student of Sal Alinsky's. I was like, oh, OK, because I've read Rules for Radicals and I know I know Sal Alinsky is like uh, the issue is never the issue. Revolution is always the issue. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a red flag, uh, this anti-racism organization falling under that so then 2017 happened uh you know i evergreen your situation really because i saw i saw that I, I i as the extreme of it i was like oh this is what this is what get back to that neuroplasticity you mentioned this is what brains that are really good at social justice ideology this is what those brains look like okay. this is how they behave and those those trainings and the equity work started to become more in integrated into my daily functions and responsibilities and conversations mm -hmm. uh, from 2017 to 2020 i attended hundreds of hours of those trainings uh, i presented some of those trainings and participated in conversations with my colleagues and uh, began questioning you know uh, i started questioning like hey what it What's going on here? Uh, I mentioned that it was, you know, philosophically it's rooted in Marxism. And I, I don't I know a lot of people kind of balk at that. But essentially, anytime the individual is reduced to an oppressor or the oppressed, I mean, yeah. that's fundamentally Marxism. And we can argue about it all we want, but essentially that's what it is. And it's actually ripping human beings apart. And it's ripping relationships apart. And this ideology is having a negative impact on our social and emotional well-being. That's essentially how I approached this was really looking at it from that professional lens and wanting to have a professional conversation with others in the field. Like if you really look at what's happening, we're increasing uh, the human capacity for prejudice, aggression and cruelty. And if you start to wonder why, then you look at the hi historical founding of the ideology, which requires humans to basically overthrow themselves from the inside and the relationships that that they're with. Okay. Yeah. So it, 
it, in a sense, it's very radical, but what about it makes it want to do that? To what effect, right? The, what about the ideology? Yeah, does the ideology have, if I can anthropomorphize it uh, somewhat, does it have a uh, kind of an ambition uh, or uh, like an end or a talos of what it wants to do all this deconstruction for? Essentially, or does it just reduces everybody into a pliant state where everything is in chaos and then something magically occurs where it is better. the The ultimate telos is to destroy individual autonomy. But what we have to do to get there is we have to destroy man's connection to God, man's connection to family, man's connection to Pat and also women and all of the other 9,000 genders uh, along the way as well. Yeah. But their connection to their past, anything associated with truth, beauty, and goodness, all, uh, private property, you know, essentially everything. And then the final thing that has to be broken is individual autonomy. Okay. And since human beings at our, at, at our rawest core, we are self-interest pursuing beings that's i mean not to not not necessarily in a greedy in a greedy way but we all have different preferences we like different things some people like to get up early some people like to get up late we pursue we, we are at our core we're, we're these beings that are meant to pursue their own way and the most tyrannical of communism and of authoritarianism cannot get rid of that like every single communist reg regime, the reason why there is so much brutality is because of that desire to pursue my own uh, self-interest. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is it about personal autonomy that gets in the way of this, what uh, Wesley Yang calls the successor ideology or what you've referenced as some form of uh, mutated Marxism? Like, what are some of the issues with liberalism? Is that a good oh, way is to that, phrase that, that question? Uh, sure. Well, what, when I so where I kind of draw the line is the the opposite of the successor ideology is essentially just re, human liberalism is kind of the broadest term that that I can that I can think of. Okay. Uh, but I guess where the people that believe in the woke worldview, why they want to overthrow liberalism is because of the, the fault in humanity. It's whenever we don't live up to those liberal, liberal principles, you know, uh, essentially one of the core ones is love thy neighbor. Hmm. Whenever we steer from not loving thy neighbor, there's an act of injustice. Mm -hmm. So the, the theory is if we can just remove the ability for the individual to to choose and for the individual to act, then there will be no harm and injustice and everybody will be in accordance, which is second grade philosophy, kind of. Yeah, and, and not by second grade, you don't mean sophomore of college, you mean literally mm -mm. second grade, yeah. Right. Like, wouldn't it be cool if everybody, <laughs> like, yeah, of course it would. It would there be great was... if there was no harm. There was, yeah, no harm. I, it's l very low-hanging fruit, but hopefully we can make it something uh, somewhat uh, profound, maybe not. There was somebody, some communist on Twitter, and communists are really interesting, like specifically like Twitter uh, communists, like the, the thinking in memes and stuff like that. And there, mm -hmm. th there was this thread where somebody some communist very explicitly had the little hammer and sickle or they had the little hammer of sickle in their uh in their title or their name showed a video of uh somebody at dunkin donuts throwing away all these donuts right and oh yeah it was capitalism capitalism's killing people it's throwing away all these things and it, there was a whole thread and then at the end it was this quote from stalin about what evil is and it was just so funny because, you know, if capitalism kills donuts, communism kills people. Right. Right. And, and then there was another quote. I don't know why I'm, uh, I'm being shown these things. Um, 
somebody who just did some sort of very poor logic about money. Money is the root of all evil. Therefore, we need if we get away from money, then we'll have this magical economy where it's all goods, right? And and what I'm trying to I don't want to like project on there, but what you're kind of saying is that all those ideas um, that are producing wealth also produce waste and that produce wealth also produce disparity because not everybody's equal in their pursuit of wealth or what wealth they inherit or what they can produce with what they're given. Um, if you take away that wealth, if you take away economy and you somehow have this supercomputer that munches up the world and spits it out in equal parsed pods, right, with your perfect protein that tastes just like every other person's protein, that will solve all disparity, all injustice. And it will also, what you're saying is it also ultimately rob us of doing anything our, of our own other than perhaps doing something artistic that doesn't cross any lines or point out that one person's more beautiful than the other kind of Harrison Bergenon thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's, that's exactly it. Um, and for some reason, this idea pops up in human history. Uh, yeah. You know, and it's interesting that this is this is just another one of those moments, uh, except for this time, it's, you know, big tech is driving it, K-12 is driving it, the state mm. is driving it, the media is driving it, the mm. music, everything is driving the ideology. So it would be really interesting to see what happens. Um, you know, and so as I was attending the DEI trainings, trying to get the attention of, of colleagues and saying, hey, you know, essentially this is this is a Marxism, uh, B, this is having social and emotional effect on us. Mm -hmm. I started working in uh, parallel on what we're now calling empowered humanity theory as mm -hmm. as an alternative, you know, because. <clears throat> It's not like I just wanted to sit around like yelling about the problem and like what's going on, obviously raising awareness of this thing is causing a lot of damage uh, in society. Yeah. And for those that do not want to continue with the damage, here's another here's another set of ideas. And these ideas were actually designed to stop acts of racism, to stop hate, to act to build up the individual and to actually using, you know, essentially evolutionary biological features, you know, thinking about tribalism and thinking about all, all of the things that we are prone to. Yeah. And then on the positive side, thinking about all the things that we're capable of, yeah. I started thinking like, okay, so what can we design to really cultivate the most positive attributes of our humanity and really tamp down those things that are causing so much damage. So those are the ideas that I was working on. Mm -hmm. And I was also told that those ideas are very dangerous. Oh. They call they cause harm uh, and are ways of upholding white supremacy, that compassion and celebrating our common humanity and mm -hmm. honoring each other's dignity are in fact ways of holding up white supremacy. Yeah. So you said these ideas stop racism, which is the same thing that the critical theory is trying to do. Um, hopefully it's trying to do that. But on, on one respect, it it, it is uh, analyzing, it, they will say, its proponents will say that it's merely analyzing uh, data to show us that uh, systemic racism exists. And that's kind of a little sleight of hand there. It's not if, it's that it does. Right. And, but there's, if you, if you turn up the dial, it's not enough to stop racism. You have to eradicate racism, right? To, you know, to dumb it down even further to, you know, a uh, Mac MacArthur genius level understanding of the world. It's not enough to not be racist. You have to actually be anti-racist. You have to root out evil from humanity um basically yeah and i've been in those anti-racism conversations you know for the past three years and and all mm -hmm. of that and it's essentially hot you know obviously hollow philosophy because one of the things i i talked about with my colleagues was that 
So anytime that we see, we are able to see another human being as we see ourselves, we are removing uh, a psychological barrier that allows us to hurt that person. Huh. Okay. So if I, if, if you and I are able to connect in a way to where we identify a similarity, like a, we have a shared experience mm-hmm. and I am psychologically programming myself not to harm you. So if we can, like, we're one of the only species that has that capability. So cultivating that quality will prevent racism. Whereas whenever, whenever we are forced to see another group as other, especially when those groups are in competition over resources with other Mm -hmm. And the media narrative, it, you know, it doesn't matter what group you're in. The, the narrative about your group is disparagingly about you. Like there's yeah. no positive attributes out there about any group. Even yeah. marginalized is presented as that's not a positive attribute. Yeah. So we're forced to see each other as another competing over resources, competing over power, and thinking about each other in the most unpleasant ways. That's the current prescription to eradicate racism. Okay, and that doesn't it, sound it, like a happy, jolly time, but I'm sure it, utopia is on the other end of that, right? Yeah, Just a few it, doesn't, generations away. it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to figure out that uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's not the formula, right? Hmm. So, hmm. so in your experience being immersed in these professional talks and probably meeting thousands of people who ascribe to this or who are at least going through the motions, but also building competence in this, why, uh, I guess maybe it's because on a mimetic level or cultural level, it's just dominant. And so most people just flip to the dominant, but why is it so seductive? Uh, let, let's let's pretend that we kind of understand and we can actually yeah, go back in there yeah. and understand wh- why it, it grew, grew power and the long march through the institutions but still people have a choice before they give up their choice right think of what it think of what it uh encourages think about what it rewards it rewards those that seek power those that seek attention those that seek glory uh mm-hmm. if you y- you can get that and I, just as so as I currently identify as I currently present myself, uh, mm. I I'm not in one of the groups that is allowed uh, social clout or political clout. Yeah. But if there if I outwardly express myself as something that I am not, I can I can make a choice to get power. I can make a choice to live a lie to get power and manipulate a situation. Mm-hmm. I can and put my put my thumb on people. So it really it rewards those that are that are uh, authoritarian. It mm-hmm. rewards t- it, those that are tyrannically inclined while it totally does not address those that really could use some help and could really use being lifted up because there are also people out there in need, you know, and this is not addressing people that are in need. It's only designed to tear down. That's the only direction that it goes is to tear down. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, suppose that uh, is a general prescription if there can be such a thing to help those in need? Like what within your empowered humanity theory and we need to get into why you chose those uh that title because it sounds kind of like more of a doctrine than a theory but maybe Mm. there's like a theoretical uh, aspect to it doctrine that word doctrine kind of scares me so maybe that's why i stayed away stayed away from that well yeah but i can uh, i can definitely tell you you know the evolution of of the title uh, um of that and about it where do you where do you want to well i just to qualify uh it it sounds like you're playing with critical theory. It sounds like this is a theory. And so it's kind of basically a doctrine by which I mean a set of uh, behavioral and uh, perceptual algorithms that help you to organize information and then make the correct moral choice. Right. So right. No, rather than a theory in like this, uh, you know, kind of like this hypothesis about right. reality, it's more of a prescription to, to get us, uh, 
to a better place. So this is uh, I'm going to say our theory because I want to talk about the rest of the rest of the Empowered Pathways team, which is yeah. Eric Smith and uh, Xander Keeg. Oh, cool. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, we. Uh, so the the theory is we is more of a a long projection. Uh, you know, the, the Frankfurt School scholars got together in the 1920s and theorized, how can we destroy a liberal free society? Because we it's can, imperfect. Right. <laughs> right. And the way, that we, the way that we can do that is we can divide them up into multiple groups, not just the bourgeois and the proletariat. The more divide them up into more groups and unite them against a single oppressor and then give them this tool of critical theory which is essentially just get them to constantly point out the problems, you know, see the world through this problematic lens while dreaming of a utopian vision. And there's no bridge of really how to get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they introduced these tools in the 1920s that would really stir tribalism and the critical theory. I believe that's, as a problem solving tool, using a problem solving tool designed for destruction, I believe that that is a significant cause of our anxiety and depression rates because we're essentially going, those that want to build up are not able to build up because we're given these horrible tools. Yeah. So, em uh, empowered humanity theory, our theory is that. If these tools and practices are introduced into the world and in every single school, every single business, then we're actually wiring the brains for compassion to be able to maintain equanimity, to see and honor the dignity in each other. So mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. idea is if, if these tools and practices are applied over time, over generations, then humanity will be liberated in ways previously unimagined. Okay. I kind of took the approach of, I don't believe that the individual is the problem. I believe that human nature and human behavior, we are capable of horrific things. So what can we do to prevent those horrific things? What can we do to make the individual more compassionate, more giving, uh, and more connected with each other so that we'll stop harming each other. Yeah. Yeah. Equanimity is a cool word. It sounds like equity and equality, but uh, I looked it up and it's, uh, I, I love etymologies, uh, humanities nerd here. So it comes from the 17th century, uh, also in the sense of fairness and partiality from Latin equanimitas from equus equal animus mind. Um, so it's not everybody having an equal mind, but it's having um, uh, a, a, a balanced mind or uh, uh, like a, um, it has another sense of equality that equity seems to kind of hint at. But in practice, you know, it's uh, we're going to saw off the legs of everybody over uh, six feet tall to get everybody down to that nice, juicy four foot eleven. Um, and then we can go around destroying fences. But. Well, and it's, <laughs> I don't know why they just don't buy tickets or somebody give them tickets. <laughs> I, I don't know. I always, I always ask like, who are the people in the stands? You know, who are, who are the, but, but anyway, uh, and so the players, so the it, players are supposed to pay for play for free. Anyways, that, that, that cartoon right. is so ridiculous. It's also the, you know, the ability to remain calm and see things as they are happening without yeah. reacting and responding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and a way that I, hmm. I was in a situation where somebody was yelling at me. They're like somebody was, I don't know. You imagine that somebody was really upset uh, with me, but somebody was, somebody was upset with me. And in that moment, instead of engaging in that behavior, I wiggled my toes. I said, my, my feet are in, in, in my head. I was like, my feet are in my shoes. I'm standing on the ground. There's a person in front of me. They're talking loudly. Yeah. I see this picture on the wall. So just this ability to really be in that moment and see things as they're happening in a calm and rational way. Okay. Because a lot of times, you know, when we react strongly to the world, we're reacting in, in these really aggressive ways at stimulus that is not really 
worthy of us acting in that way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for, for example, uh, I was, I was in the car with, uh, one of, one of my daughters a while back and there was a loud crash like right next to us. And she was like, Whoa, what? And I, you know, I, I, I kept driving and she was like, what was that? I said, it was a, it was a wreck. She's like, why are you so chill right now? And I went into, you know, I, I saw what happened. I understood that those, you know, kind of walked through that situation. And then, you know, we talked a little bit about equanimity, seeing things as they are in, in that moment. And that takes, that takes training, you know, my, and mindfulness, a mindfulness practice is one of those things that actually cultivates that skill. Mm -hmm. It cultivates us to be able to, Mm -hmm. to remain to remain calm in those situations and that's where a lot of that's where a lot of harm comes from a lot of injustice comes from those innate reactions uh that are usually driven by fear or judgment yeah and empowered humanity theory also hopes to disrupt those thoughts of fear and judgment with mindsets yeah. of inquiry and compassion okay so whenever, you know, another time when I'm presenting with difficult people in difficult situations, uh, instead of going to that judgment mode, you know, I think about approaching that situation of that person through a lens of compassion and inquiry. You know, I, the other day I saw somebody really mistreat a cashier and I wonder, I was like, what makes people so mean, you know? Yeah. Rather than like this man is a horrible man, I because I could see it on his face. I just wondered like, what makes people mean? I wonder what's happening to this man right here. So really, replacing those thoughts to yeah. not to not do harm. There was a moment in my Evergreen experience, and I believe it's uh, part twenty two or twenty three of my documentary. If anybody wants to experience this uh, through a recording that I made of it, but we were in class. It was my last class for Evergreen, uh, well, my last program, uh, like fourth from the last actual class. And the uh, I had been watching over the last couple of years this social justice ideology um, take root between classes through the administration become like kind of like the, the cause of the college, the, the cause of the college. And then it went from there into the classroom and it started to encroach into the classroom specifically through one way, uh, not just through these trainings where you're presented with how to see the world, but there was this psychological kind of uh, group therapy session that we were supposed to do more and more and more. And it was adulating trauma and then it was divvying up whose trauma can be compacted by this intersectional calculus. So everybody's basically broken. Everybody's got trauma. But then you, you do this little identity thing and then it gets really big or really, you know, or, or, or it's diminutive. And in that class that uh, one of the the actual the student aide uh, said that if somebody said the name Brett Weinstein or said that he wasn't a bad guy, she will punch them in the face. Right. I'm like, OK. Uh, that, I know that's pretty much an empty threat, but if something happens, I know exactly who will get off and who will be blamed. Um, mm -hmm. doesn't matter who does the violence. We know who is responsible for the violence. So I started to record uh, that session, and in this recording, you hear these people of a, a certain identity, um, but – their character and their identity, it doesn't matter. They're just running this program, right? So I don't mean to judge them personally. They were caught up in this thing and then they were egged on by the entire infrastructure of the college at this point. These people, this one identity started to pick on a white girl, very important identity to pick on, uh, because she was getting frustrated because she was told that she needs to shut the F up and that her silence is literal violence. And those levers were being put back and forth. And she started getting more and more frustrated with because it's an impossible situation. And I was there across the room from from her and she was looking at me for help for, for some reason. I, and I just tried to signal there's no winning. You don't play. There's no winning. You don't play. But because she started to get frustrated, those people who were basically traumatizing her were getting more and more gleeful and more and more empowered. And that was just, um, sorry for the long, uh, experience no, no, that no. I had. but it, it was just, it was showing me that all this trauma stuff with the intersectional calculus, that's what it produces. Like they want to make the world more fair by tearing everybody down. 
Yeah. And I intuit that the principles that you're speaking about, one is equanimity, and you also said inquiry and compassion and uh, examination, and I would probably put on reasoning through things. You don't just observe. I mean, you, you ground yourself, then you observe, and then you reason through things, like you said, with that cashier experience. Like, yeah. why is this man doing this thing? Yeah. So yeah. it puts you in a position to actually start to calculate and, and to cogitate things rather than just engage in this war game that if you actually look at it from any sort of outside perspective, you can see it's ruination all the way down. There's no end to There's no end. There's, there's, uh, like I said, the ultimate end is finally getting rid of individual autonomy. And even if we start destroying every single thing now, it's going to take us a long time oh, yeah. to get there's to that point. There's plenty of work to do. The work never I, ends. And I know, I know zero people that have, uh, burned down their house or turned over their mortgage to the, the home they own, even though they profess that they're on stolen land all the time, mm. you know, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I don't know when those things are going to take place, but surely any time. Well, they'll, they'll have to be enforced from once, you know, and then that goes to it. It's the meme of the people who are going to be first up against the wall. Like, like, and if you watch, like, actually Evergreen, they loathe, I mean, the the, the far right and Trump and et cetera, th that's an existential threat. But they actually hate, like, they just fear Trump and his henchmen that are everywhere around every corner. But they right. actually hate the liberals. They hate George Bridges. They hate everybody who is trying to be kind to them. Like, yeah. that is the, the actual where their ire actually lands. Yeah. I, I've been – I – my talk of a common humanity mm -hmm. and talk about, you know, our share, our shared history, our shared now, and hopefully what our shared future will look like. And mm -hmm. that we are all connected, whether we like it or not, we are all part of this same story and same experiment. And we need to figure that out. That idea has caused people, me expressing that has caused people to leave the room. Okay. Uh, when Why I talk is that about, so insulting or assaulting to them? I, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I think it's something in something in the ideology that says that if people espouse these beliefs, then they are uh, bigots and, and racist. They're outcast. And, and the way I talk about human dignity uh, has caused people to leave the room. And I've. I had that conversation many times, and every time I say it, I listen to myself, and I, I still don't know anything that's so alarming uh, to the social justice ideology folk, but it's really, really alarming. What is – could you uh, do the dignity spiel sure. just so I understand what you mean sure. by dignity? So I, I, I separate – I take the, you know, the, take the term human being and separate the human from the being. Okay. The human is essentially the the biology and the conditioned personality, what you're interacting with here, how we how how we see and view each other. Okay. And then underneath that is is the being. Hmm. And all beings uh, share two qualities. And that is the desire to avoid suffering and the desire to alleviate the suffering of others when we encounter it. Okay. So honoring each other through a dignity lens is when we can actually separate that biology and that personality because personalities can be difficult, right? Uh, people, people are challenging and you can actually not respect somebody, but still honor the dignity of that person and still honor the dignity of yourself by not mistreating that person. Okay. So... I, I like to talk about dignity and a dignity lens as the ultimate lever for equity. If there's any sort of just world, that has to be it. Like that I, has to be how we we interact with each other. I can't think of any other way. I can see. I'm trying to see how that would be offensive. But if 
you are humanizing somebody who is complicit in these systems of oppression, then you, by allowing that to happen and not putting that person in their place or limiting their autonomy, because it's obviously not only misguided but actively harmful, you are not doing your job to allevi alleviate suffering. By, by allowing yourself to humanize that bad person, you are actually allowing for evil to persist through humanity. And I, I could kind of see why any, any roadblock to justice, and that would be a roadblock to justice, humanizing somebody. Well, and then, so the flip side of that is <clears throat> the person that was behaving in horrible ways, whenever they can see somebody else, whenever that person is also being humanized in that situation. So a lot of a lot of future harm would actually be dismantled and disrupted. So just to bring it back to preschool, I think I, I see it and please correct me. So when there is a child who is upset, uh, anger, pain, whatever, they're, they're in an upset, they're in an agitated place, I could be agitated along with them. Um, I could share their pain and cry with them or, or get really worried and very compassionate and perform this compassion and kind of try to overload their feeling of pain with my feeling of compassion and somehow like alleviate that. Um, and that's one way of going about doing that. Or if they are doing something bad, I can be really angry and stern and I can overpower them with my superior emotional force. Um, but that just means that the, that emotional force will m remain in the environment and it'll just pop up over and over and over again. One thing that I learned to do was that I just look at them and I recognize them apart from their state, apart from their emotion or their behavior. I recognize the person and in the case of like a scraped knee, um, by recognizing them, they get to recognize their pain and actually start to reason through their pain and kind of stop reacting to it because I'm not yeah. reacting to it either. I'm reacting to them as a human being. So yeah. with, in the case of somebody who's acting badly or being a bad person and social justice can see that in everything and every time from a, a microaggression to, you know, all out genocide. It's all a pyramid. It's all connected, right, for them. Um, but what you're saying is that if you recognize somebody in those small moments and, and you dignify their humanity, they will more likely become more conscious of the humanity of other people and act. For sure. For sure. And, and I'm not saying if somebody is being, you know, if I'm seeing somebody being an overt racist or an overt bigot in that particular moment and i go up and try to you know offer some like peace offering in that moment when they're behaving that's not that's definitely not what i'm saying uh <clears throat> just to be clear for the others that are like oh you can't just extend yeah in, in those moments i'm also i've also said i i will stand up for any injustice in the moment that, that i can stand up for and speak out against okay you know i'm, yeah. I'm right there with with all of you all on that, but I'm not tearing down human history to yeah. to look for it. <laughs> okay. Well, so there's egregious acts of harm that need to be confronted and put to rest. Right. Uh, right. Harassing a, let's just say somebody at a bar harassing a woman, you know, and you, you kind of stand up for the woman. Um so there's that, but being, but first and foremost, if you're always in a reasoning state and you're able to, uh, I guess, put the human in the context of that moment, then you can probably more accurately gauge um, the correct response of a, to a microaggression or a, a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a microaggression, somebody yelling at a cashier. I mean, what are you going to do in that moment? I mean, uh, you let that happen and then you recognize the cashier, try to lift them up. I don't know confront right. that guy or whatever, you know, but if you're always reasoning through these things with a compassionate lens, you'll be able to, even if something needs to happen to end it, you'll still right. uh, be able to restrain and use the minimum effective force to correct things. Yeah. And you know, a lot, you know, most things you can just walk away from because it doesn't really concern you. Hmm. And there's no reason to, uh, try to, I call it, uh, ghost hunting, you know, mm -hmm. looking for things that, that aren't there 
all the time and seeing things in this most horrific way. When you were talking about, uh, you know, the evergreen students, and then you asked me earlier, like, what are the motivations of the successor ideology? Yeah. I was reminded, I, I read a book, uh, I guess it was this past summer, but the title of it was The World in the Grip of an Idea. And it went through the historical account of when this idea has popped up over time. And I believe it was published in the early to mid 70s. Uh, But one of the things that really stuck out to me said Marxism is the religion of socialism and it justifies and sanctifies our most evil and primitive urges. Hmm. So it got me thinking, you know, there's been a lot of comparisons to quote unquote wokeism and it is functioning as a religion. Mm-hmm. And it does seem to be the religion of this new communism, socialism, whatever is kind of emerging. Corporatism. Yeah, Corporatism. Kind of really, uh, stakeholder yeah. capitalism, I guess, yeah, is yeah, what they're one. what they're gonna what they're calling it. But it just it, that struck me as like, wow, that is really true in this moment. And that was an observation that somebody had made in the uh, you know. 40 years before wokeism became a phenomena. Okay. So it's a pretty strong statement to say that something yeah, what is, was it justifies or justifies evil and, and primitive and, urges and sanctifies. And sanctifies, okay. Yeah. Well, why it, would it do so, such a thing? I don't know, <laughs> but if you look at how, so I, I think that uh pursuing power is one of those most evil and primitive urges that we have is that this this urge and desire for power mm. and i see that this movement mm. does reward those that seek power okay power like the and ability I, to expend human resources i guess uh, to command the throngs kind of thing is that what power yes, is the status and, and even on a more <laughs> everyday level The ability to put your thumb down on somebody else. Okay. Okay. So exerting dominance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Through like every, and, and I see that, you know, it on, on small scales, like in small working groups and in communities, I see those that are really, those that really profess the ideology are the ones that are, have the most control in groups and of organizations and dictate who gets to say what Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all you have to do is profess the ideology you know you see uh, jp morgan you know they're once they started professing the ideology then people people back backed off and all the other corporations you know the military switched flags and now everybody's all so you know that that's kind of what i'm talking about is you get to Okay. have power and some of your actions exonerated yeah yeah exactly we're looked yeah and until they like come for you again but you just keep on sacrificing bits of yourself to them like here's a colonel he did something wrong you can right have, uh, because they are coming after you because your autonomy has to be you know hmm. maybe you're gonna maybe you're gonna escape out of this life without having all of your freedoms taken away but there are people that <laughs> will be born God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are people that will be born, you know, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Mm-hmm. So the the ideas that we're advancing today, those civilizations are going to have to deal with the consequences. Yeah. So there sounds like a mix of uh Christianity and Buddhism in here on a on a principle level. I don't know yes. about a belief yeah. system, but yeah. um, you said, you know, uh, the empowered humanity theory, uh, you guys, you guys want it to be taken up. You think that it's a good plan to make people more compassionate, reasonable, productive, uh, and probably yeah. wealthy externally, but also internally and healthy, um, and connected. Um, but is it sexy? Critical theory is so sexy, right? It's so sexy to destroy the gender binary, to profess your right. hatred of, of patriarchy, right. you know, and, and, to, and to stake your ground on, on, on the black life that was taken a thousand yeah. miles from you yeah. and burn yeah. down your city you know, and demand that everybody bow 
before your raised fist, right? That is sexy. That's that's hot. It's got power. It's emotional. It's youthful. It's it, you know, it's 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 flowing forth with so much righteous indignation. W- being calm. What's so attractive about that? That's 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 a good question. You know, because if you and I were given the option of like, hey, the you, you've got. 30 minutes. Do you want to go into a room and have the ability to throw a thousand plates against the wall? Or do you want to take a pottery class and learn mm-hmm. how to sit down and, and sculpt to play it out and, yeah. and, and do all that in that particular moment, it's going to feel fun breaking things, especially yeah. if yeah. they're like, you know what, uh, Jason and Benjamin, by breaking these things, you're right. And you're going to be rewarded for uh With breaking these or, f- or at least finger snaps uh, but i think may- maybe the ultimate reward is you know those that have been involved in the ideology for so long uh and see that it is just this constant state of destruction hmm. and it's taken a mental toll on me okay and i'm and i'm tired i'm tired of being divided from my fellow humans i'm tired of the relationships that I've lost the family disconnections that I've lost. I feel something missing inside. I want to build up myself and I want to figure out how to actually make things better. Okay. I want to figure out how to, how to build. I'm tired of destroying. So maybe it appeals. uh, Yeah. Maybe that's how it's sexy. Yeah. It's creative. Yeah. the, The pottery thing is actually a good, um, metaphor. Um, you know, uh, I don't know why, but it makes me think of, uh, all those movies and TV shows, whenever somebody's upset, they have to destroy a bunch of things and you never see yeah. anybody cleaning that up, you know, like they no. get in a they look through the thing, you know, but, um, you never see anybody actually cleaning up afterwards. And that's why I don't do that to my house. You know, maybe I, I'm in a state where I do want to break things and hopefully I'm not, but, uh, the, the feeling of, uh, creating a sculpture or something or a cup, you know, like that, yeah. there's a, a, a great pleasure in that. Um, that's that's closer to a longer lasting pleasure. Um, right. And, and right. that's, yeah. that's, that's where I, that's where I am. And that's why I've been focused on these ideas to build up and yeah. to reform yeah. rather than uh, destroy and want to really appeal to those that are, are making that want to make a, an honest decision and an effort to step aside and actually begin building up. You know, I think of us like the two ideologies, if you can think that we're on a ship and right now mm-hmm. almost all of us are hanging out on the side of the successor ideology, whether we intended to be there or not. And if we don't get some people back over to the liberalism side, then mm. the ships, the ship sunk. Okay. Um, well, one, are you... Do you feel comfortable explaining what successor ideology means? Like why he chose those words? Wesley Yang chose successor, like success, successor. What what does that mean? As <clears throat> now, I, I may twist Yang's words or get something wrong, so yeah. I can deal with the internet if if that does happen. <laughs> hey, are you but, sure uh, about that? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> uh, but essentially, you know, it is. Let's look at the the sensual uh, virtues of the of the two worldviews. The liberalism, the virtues are truth, beauty, and goodness. Mm-hmm. And essentially, the successor ideology virtues are nihilism and cynicism. Well, okay, wait, hold on. Why would somebody ascribe to nihilism and cynicism? It feels good, but it's not. It's not. It's not billed as that. Uh, it's not sold as that. It's no, sold it's as definitely else, not right? sold. It's definitely okay. not sold as critical theory and revolution. Okay. But critical theory is essentially systemic uh, cynicalism, if you will. <laughs> it sounds like some sort of thing that a, the ice cream man would sell you on a very twisty road. Um, so, I, the, okay, I'm... I'm just trying to erect the circumstances where this would promulgate and 2020 is the proper, I mean, we could go through evergreen, but 2020 was the the great uh, awakening. So what happened was that uh, we're, we're 
afraid to death of death. So we're going to stop our lives to avoid death and to avoid killing people. Uh, if, if, even mm -hmm. if you don't care about your life, you, you have to stay inside. And then a, a life was taken and something even more profound than the fear of death took over the nation. And those people who were in the CDC, I think it was, were, were saying, oh, no, oh, no, lockdown, lockdown. No, actually, systemic racism is a, is a greater ideal. It's a greater, it's, a, it's more powerful than COVID, which kind of screwed yes. up the whole data set and my trust in them. But whatever, that's a whole other issue. Uh, so what happens, why people adopt the revolutionary cynicism is that they are presented with data that shows them that the world is imperfect, that injustice is occurring. And that action is necessary now to stop this. Because if you don't speak up, you're a part of the problem. You're complicit. Yeah. Right? So then yep. you adopt it. So you're rushed into that, right? And then you find on the other side that everything needs to be torn down. And you yeah. are not aware that you're pursuing nihilism and cynicism. You're using cynicism to defeat a problem. And it's, it's leading you towards nihilism. So when you... I'm just trying to... You're a hoodwink understand by that. compassion. Okay, you know? by compassion, by empathy. Yeah. Empathy yeah. draws you into that. Whereas on the liberal end, truth, beauty, good are things that we are pursuing. We're pursuing those things. And, and we kind of try to, you, you know, you get in a lot of philosophical discussions insofar as you do about like, to what degree should I pursue the perfection of these mm -hmm. things without it actually making me feel small and weak? Right. Because that's what you're actually confronted with, your your smallness, your ineptitude in actually doing something beautiful because you actually have to work to be good, to, yes. to know truth, and to affect beauty. Like, you actually have to work at that. Whereas this other successor ideology, um, you just act. You, you yeah. just act and then you'll figure it out on the ground while you're going. So you don't have that stress of, uh, you know, and the weight of pursuing these ideals on the liberal end. Right. And, and then uh, the other, some other components of the successor ideology are, you know, obviously critical theory and all of the, just as a, as a tool, which is the counter of, I believe, of critical theory is essentially uh, the Judeo-Christian values you know, and not necessarily all of the tenets of those religions. Yeah, not the belief part, but the... Lo uh, love thy neighbor, uh, grace, forgiveness, you know, some of those, some of those basic ideas that came out of, out of those cultures. Hmm. Uh, and then intersectionality is a big component of this is successor ideology, which essentially reinforces human tribalism. And that is... Hmm kind of taking the place of replacing meritocracy, which that's one of the liberal values. Yeah. Um, meritocracy and, and individualism or, or and, human dignity uh, in, in yeah. another sense. And the common humanity kind of thing. Yeah. And then the diversity, equity, and inclusion are, yeah. rep are the value replacements for individualism, meritocracy, and believing okay. that we're all created equal. Okay. Yeah. And... Okay. All of my training that I've been to, all of those liberalism values that I discussed and talked about, I've spent more time talking about how those uh, thoughts, values, and virtues are causes of white supremacy than I have what are things we can do to make uh, children and adult lives better. Okay. So it's just uh, this, as a trainer and as at a trainee. As a trainer and at training. Oh wow. Okay. And then I realized that uh, one mm -hmm. of the things I learned during the lockdown was in 1927, Trotsky first deemed those that spoke out against the party as racist. Mm -hmm. He was the one that actually invented that technique. So when oh. I see when I hear you know truth, beauty, and goodness, and meritocracy, and believing that we're all created equal. Because all I hear that those are the bad things and those are the racist things, I'm like, oh, that's exactly that's the tactic that uh, Trotsky used. Because when I'm okay, in these yeah. trainings, when when I was in those trainings, that was the topic of those trainings that those things are bad. There's a <sighs> popular a popular charter school stopped using their motto of "be nice and work hard" <laughs> for their for their <laughs> equity for their equity purposes oh god 
You know, the, the, the problem, I mean, it's so racist and narrow and manipulative and it's just so obvious too. So it's, it's kind of stupid at this point. I just feel like I'm just going over and over and over again, the same thing, but I still find it funny that if you, if you were playing a game, just some sort of really complex society building like video game or board game or something like that. And you wanted to create the superior society, you would have the individuals pursue truth, beauty, and goodness and work really hard and be nice amongst each other. And that would create the superior thing. If you, you wanted think- to... If you want to create a loser society, you make them fight each other, yeah. hate beauty, truth, goodness, not show up on time, not yeah. hold anybody accountable for anything other than some sort of pseudo sin, you know? Right. <laughs> uh, so I saw today uh, one of the latest uh, ways to fix that sin. New York City public libraries are doing away with late fees for equity. So Okay. That's, All right. That's good. Yeah, no, no accountability. Accountability um, hurts some people more than others. The irresponsible yeah. kind, and irresponsibility is a part, uh, or responsibility itself is a part of privilege because you can afford to be responsible because you came from right. a responsible family that was denied these other people. So it's just the whole thing, and and people don't really understand. They see one narrow, like people who are sympathetic to this, they see one narrow thing and they see it on the surface, and it looks really good on the surface. It's it's done a lot of uh, adaptations to make it mm-hmm. palpable, but if you start yes. to study how it's connected in all these different ways. And it's going all the way from the, you know, suspending late fees, right? Which yeah. means that the books are just going to disappear. And it's, you could tie it all the way down to 12 year old girls getting their breasts removed. It's yeah. all connected. People it's don't all see connected. that. It's all connected. That's that, uh, was it Gramsci? That's like, okay, so everything has to be flipped upside down. We have to, we flip society upside down and reverse the hegemony. Then things will be better. <laughs> There's this, I this mean, like weird kind of programming yeah. thing where, and then like, and, and then and what? Then, and then yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to stick around for them. Then what? Why don't you, can we just stop? Can we just stop already mm. yeah. and shift gears? Hmm. Mm-hmm. I really, um, there was something that I wanted to explore just a little bit more, expand upon. For sure. You were, you did this beautiful thing there of uh, comparing and contrasting the liberal side from successor ideology and, and explaining successor ideology and how there's like these flip sides to it. And you said that grace and forgiveness are opposite from critical theory. So what is it about critical theory that's the opposite of grace and forgiveness? And what is it about grace and forgiveness? What are those qualities? Why do they work? And why are they needed to be gotten or destroyed, dismantled by this thing called critical theory? So what's the relationship between those things? Wow. What an awesome question. Uh, And I wonder, so I wonder if maybe grace and forgiveness are more in conflict with repressive tolerance Mm -hmm. than Mm -hmm. with than with critical theory. Uh, But maybe I can, I I do understand that a, if there is forgiveness, then, then the, and grace, then the battle is over. Huh? So perhaps that's the rejection of grace and forgiveness. If, If there, if there is grace and there is forgiveness, then what what battle and what war is there is there to wage and rage? Okay, so Tim Wise or Weiss? Did we just I, figure uh, something out? <laughs> well, it, it well, it just it it's you know at some points I, I want to rage against this particular machine um, if it can be called a machine because it doesn't it's not even logically consistent. Um, it's more of like a virus or a disease or a cancer yeah. the machine. Yeah. But, you know, I got to rage against it. Sometimes I rage against it. And sometimes it just makes me really sad because uh, grace and forgiveness, like I would be ruined if I didn't receive those things. <laughs> you know, yeah. I would be ruined. I, w- I would not be around today. I would have figured a way out of this game if I hadn't been given those things and continually be uh, graced and, and forgiven. Um, but Tim Weiss was talking about this kid, Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, you know, mm-hmm. uh, 2020 riots, he's armed, he got attacked by the skateboards, it became a left-right issue because he defended himself. And, uh, you know, the uh, three 
unsavory characters uh, got wounded or killed, you know, one of them being a sex offender. But we don't think of that. We think of this white boy privilege going to a gun, trying to shoot up the protest or whatever. And Tim Wise, who's this like he's top top of the he never got as big as D'Angelo, but he was doing the same grift. He's still doing the same grift. He does this anti-racism thing and, and you know, okay. preaches to white about guilt and, and berates the, the whites for um, blaming, you know, for doing all this. For evil, being. But, for being basically for for being and doing and and uh, existing, but um, you know, he said that Kyle Rittenhouse should not be forgiven. He, he should. It was just like the stripping of due process, right? Like this, mm-hmm. this ultimate. Like we don't want even due process anymore because we can't afford for anybody to get off. They all need to be punished. We need to do away with the uh, that. I don't know what it is. Within law, we do have some sort of trying to get to a correct justice, right? Trying to to meet out retribution correctly and to allow people to be innocent. There can't be innocence. There can't be forgiveness. There can't even be payment. It seems like ultimately because it can't be even calculated. So there, yeah. it, like it, it, it actually marches towards a guillotine. It marches toward. It does that because it just has to be. You have to be, you have to not exist and we have to watch you cease existing. Like that's where it seems like if you strip grace and forgiveness, then you do have, it's even beyond repressive tolerance, but. It is. And also, you know, grace and forgiveness, look at what it would do to power structure and power dynamics. Mm -hmm. Like there's, it's hard to maintain that power and control over somebody if there is a true element of, of grace and, and forgiveness. Expand on that. No, no resentment to hold on to. Cause I think there's, <clears throat> there okay. can be power and thumb down in, in resentment and this okay. movement. And by actually by promoting a privileged class that's cultivating that resentment so since grace and forgiveness is kind of the opposite of there, so mm-hmm. essentially mm-hmm. just grace and forgiveness and love thy neighbor are the antithesis of what 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 is happening. Jesus Christ. I mean, like, I, I've said this before. It's so satanic. It's like literally Satanism. I mean, sorry, okay. Satanists oh, who aren't n- bored. Sorry, Satanists. There's some good. So, okay. But still. I, I had a similar it's thought. It's Antichrist. I, I had a similar thought the other day. And since you touched on it, let's okay. just kind of kind of go, go there. there for a second. Yeah. You know, think back to that quote about it justifies and sanctifies our, our most evil urges and primal urges. Yeah. And if I want to clamor for power, I can get that. And, and, but the thought that I had the other day, I was real, I've really been troubled by mm. with the people that get so alarmed when I talk about dignity, like I talk about it. Yeah. When I talk about our common humanity and the people that are most uh, repulsed and have the most visceral reactions are the ones that are the most, uh, the most devout believers of the ideology. So I, the only thing I can think of is like, wow, that the only explanation I can have for you to be so triggered and alarmed by that is that there's really and truly this element of evil in this that perhaps is capturing the hearts and minds of, of people. Yeah. 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 Well, and blinding and blinding them to that evil. Yeah. Yeah. like like that quote says under the name of compassion and love so i feel like you're yeah. i feel like you're pretty spot on <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately okay. it's such a weird yeah. time yeah it is so i'm i'm in um trying to figure out the the proper way to go about being a warrior uh, for for actual what i perceive of as social justice you know um which is just like being sociable and just you know let's you know <laughs> right. um and a reluctant uh activist that i am thanks to evergreen uh why did i even go there if i didn't want to become an activist what do we do what do we not do what's the correct way to to confront this and what's the incorrect way to confront this uh, one thing that I appreciate that you recently did uh, was kind of your take on the anti-woke movement. And I forget just just the comments that you made about the, the libs of TikTok, you know, mm-hmm. and 
and the type of uh, like porn that that was that attention porn that that was driving. Uh, I really honestly feel like we have to stop just screaming at each other, you know, uh, and really mm. understand what is at stake here is hmm. individual autonomy is the right of an individual to choose to live their life. Uh, that that is really and truly what is at stake here. This is not a Republican thing. This is not a Democrat thing. This is not even the critical race theory versus a non-critical race theory yeah, thing. Yeah. Like we're in a this is a, yeah. a moment in human history that really requires all of our attentions and for all of us to make a decision mm -hmm. in our mind and in our heart. Are we builders and are we destroyers? And if we choose to be builders, you and I, I we have made that conscious effort to be builders. So well, we I do have some to, demolition, but I try to control it. That's the for thing. For sure. But <laughs> I feel that we have to live our lives in ways that demonstrate that we are builders, uh, how we interact with each other, who, you know, how big of a circle can we draw? Hmm. Where is the line that we draw in the sand and mine is essentially i want to maintain a, a, a free society so yeah. <clears throat> that's what i see and having open conversations about what exactly this moment in time is and what yeah. is required of of our attention like let's mm. stop let's stop these the traditional partisan conversations that we've had you know red and blue and all of these things that really don't mean anything anymore hmm. to figure out what makes sense to us and mm -hmm. what ideas do we want to you know think about the ideas as, as a baton and we're passing them off to a new generation yeah do we want to pass them the tools of destruction in hopes that maybe one day somebody will put those tools down and then begin building up again no. Uh, or do we want to realize that we've been blessed to live in the freest, the most comfortable period of time, and that is what is, we're at risk of losing? Uh, do we? What do we do now? How can we expand our circles? How can we have conversations that might be a little bit more uncomfortable? Uh, yeah. How do we? What alliances can we can we form? Who can yeah. we? You know, just really get get back to those to those basics, but, but yeah. just keep doing what we're doing. And I really appreciate how you're how you are doing it in, you know, in an open and honest and meaningful way and yeah. know where we need to pull the brakes, because the the reaction, the historical reaction to communism has always been, you know, exactly what they said Donald Trump was. Like the response, like if we do go this route, the historical reaction is somebody that is really that awful, really that fascist and really that ty tyrannical. Yeah. So we're setting the stage for tyranny and then the reaction from that tyranny would be more tyranny. So how about we just chill out right now and figure, <laughs> and figure it out now? Let's quit tyrannying ourselves apart. Right. Yeah, we don't need the uh, tyrannical Olympics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is worse than the oppression Olympics. <laughs> yes, it's like yes. the bonus episode <laughs> that we don't want to go to. <laughs> so, so what are what are some activities that you do above and beyond um, some some social emotional learning uh, teaching and and uh, this project that you guys are working on? What are something beyond this that you are really geeking out on? That just just myself? Yeah, just, just you. Like, what's your hobby, your fun thing? It could be anything from... Man, I, don't know. I absolutely love music. Uh, oh. I love I love shows. Uh, that That's my thing, I, I you, think. So uh, you're like a connoisseur level uh, musician in gesture. Is that what you're saying? I, I can I do not play it, uh, but okay. that's been my that's been my lifelong uh, really escape and out is listening to music. Um, do you so I, you have a thorough collection then? You, you you're pretty knowledgeable about what's your genre or like where you? Uh... I'm all over the place, but I'm gonna. Okay. Uh, 
I'm a huge fish guy. If you can imagine that, oh really? Uh, no, I can't. I do. Can I do. I do, yeah. I do enjoy yeah. fish. I enjoy the dead. I enjoy. Um. Huh. Uh, I like jazz. I really dig what Kamasi Washington uh, is doing. Kamasi. K A M A S I? No? It may be. Yes, yeah. And, what, the, and the last name? Washington. Yeah, okay. What, what, what are they doing? Thundercats doing some cool stuff, you know? Okay. Yeah. That's one of the things, you know, I, I, uh, I miss about the world. Pre-Rona. Oh, yeah, pre-Rona. <laughs> Comedy's good, you know, just uh, yeah, yeah. I recently moved out into the middle of nowhere, so that's yeah. that's interesting as well. You, do, you, do you listen to the sounds of nature when you I step do. outside or I the do. absence of the sounds of humans? I do, yes. Are you adjusting okay to that? I am, I am. Yeah. It's uh, I left the confines of Austin a few months ago. Oh, and okay. I'm, fe- I'm feeling really good about that situation yeah. about that decision yeah austin uh i don't know i think it's headed in the direction of portland but who knows they're trying knows? they're trying yeah. real hard <laughs> <laughs> yeah really really beautiful but at the same time like that uh, uh kind of weird bubble thing how can we make it less beautiful uh, more weird i guess be- beauty and weirdness why why okay here's the thing so truth beauty goodness but what about weirdness where does that isn't isn't that a liberal value being weird being a geek that, <clears throat> isn't that the uns, unsung that is yes virtue. so truth beauty yeah. and good that's the traditional classical liberal values but yeah. being weird is that so that's more and get is gets into the individualism oh okay oh yeah, yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. please yeah we need we need more weirdos Okay. I was thinking yeah. the other day. So another another way out of this is if uh, if is if the the Jesus freaks, the dirty hippies, and the punk rockers, hmm. like if they can expand their movements. Oh, okay. And we need grow their grow their movements. Grow their base, those yeah. social movements would be would be an interesting counter to the conformity and, and lack of love and openness that we see now. Well, you know, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, a lot of, a lot of my friends in my circles are saying, you know, I mean, we, we have these conversations like we're having now. Um, we're like, well, it's probably going to be art, you know, it's probably going to be some sort of culture, but it doesn't have to be like some sort of like Beethoven doesn't need to rise, but just like kind of weird people come back. Yeah. This, this, this movement, it, it's it, you know like we we talked about it being evil satanic you know but it's it's flat it's really it's flat, flat and boring yeah. and, and 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 repetitious rep and and critiquing the thing I, I saw somebody uh, kind of a big guy on uh, Twitter was critiquing Chappelle's latest special which a lot of people are praising because it's anti woke but this guy was just pointing out like is this all we have to talk about you know this is all we have to talk about is woke and then the the response to the woke. It, even if it kind of relieves pressure and is funny and like allows us to breathe a little bit more, it's still it's still about this thing, whatever this thing right. is. This this ideology is still dominating all culture. So you either you even have to just be against it, um, and breaking out of that, you know, going into some sort of weird. Uh, hopefully, don't get too culty, but some sort of like re- religious journey, you know, yeah. travel with the band, you know, yeah, uh, you maybe get a little bit of trouble here and there, you know, uh, spray paint something other than a cab, you know. On, right on a bus bench, you know, like kind of break out something, and that 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 staleness that was something that I began to notice around 2018, 2017. I yeah. I noticed that in my profession, I wasn't growing. There was no mm. innovation. Oh, okay, I had so I I started feeling stale and stagnant, and really turned to Stoic philosophy. Mm. Started a uh, you know. Ex- some of the tradition, I guess the IDW type people and ideas listening, I was like, okay, there is actually something, yeah. something a little bit new out there. But, but I definitely felt that staleness and like yeah. I reached a point and I was like, oh yeah, this is not designed to do anything. It's just designed to destroy. <laughs> Yeah, well, and and uh, destroy on a number of different levels. I mean, like there's the sexy ultimate destruction, but there's just this kind of hollow, like this other kind of this subtle mature destruction of like 
you know, salt and, and, and sugar, you know, like just like a nice balanced meal. Like it's all kind of like intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, everything just becomes really, really black and very white and then, and, and then strobing. And then you kind of lose your sense of taste and smell and, and, and subtlety. And you realize, oh, I'm trapped in a cult. How do I get out? <laughs> <laughs> So where can people uh, hook up with you uh, and Eric and Xander in this empowered humanity theory? What, what you guys have websites, uh, website. Yeah. And stuff Check like out uh, empowered, empowered pathways.org. You know, we're a, we're a 501 C three and our focus is to a uh, provide an explanation of what is happening right now yeah. in this moment in time, offer, a different approach and to even provide opportunities for healing and reconciliation to working groups and communities that have been ripped apart yeah. from this, because that's another, yeah. that's another missing piece is that to, to kind of pick up the pieces from, from what is happening. And on the website, there is, I put a, I recently put a statement up top that says our understanding and statement of this moment in time, to really kind of break down that human liberalism versus successor yeah. ideology for people. And then yeah. also the ideas of empowered humanity theory are, are on the website as well. Uh, but if you would like us to a come in and work with your school or work with your uh, working group um, instead of the destructive trainings and workshops that people are doing, uh, those are some things that we you offer guys are providing well. an alternative and you're also billing yourselves as uh, anti-racist and anti-discriminatory i mean in in practice in the long yeah. run that's that's the effect that you guys are uh determined or certain that this these ide ideas will right there's elicit. there's real harm and injustice out there uh let's here are some practices and tools to address and prevent future acts from happening yeah Stop the, the, the cycle, the great wheel. Well, Jason, I'm going to wrap up the recording now. Thank you very okay, much cool. for joining me on this uh, rip-roaring conversation. Yeah, um, for sure. I appreciate it. I hope, uh, I hope you found it meaningful. I found it very fun and meaningful. Good deal. Good deal. I did, too. Fun as well. It was a good time for you, too. Congratulations for reaching the end of the discussion. If you enjoyed it, do be sure to leave a review or a comment or a thumbs up or whatever you need to do to show that glorious algorithm that this is some good stuff. And do be sure to go and check that back catalog as it is brimming full of fantastic conversations. Links to provide monetary support are down there in the description as well. Have a good night.